So, um, again, um, by 1913, things were happening. On off through 1920, um, um, the industry, as an art form, just kept growing and growing and growing, and getting better and better and better. Um, the men that were and, and women that were in the industry in the industry were were pretty poor souls. They came from Europe, um, mostly. Clap rope didn't have much to their name, and beg, borrow, and steal, and stole. And started with small little movie theaters, not unlike this. They just set up some chairs. They bought a projector, mostly leased from Edison, and uh, and they started showing movies. Problem was, the industry took off. It got crazy, and there wasn't enough product out, so they started making their own. The Warner Brothers, all of them, MGM, Paramount, it goes Universal. Uh, with Lumley and, and so um, things happened real fast. They didn't know how to handle it and knew uh, they started spending so much money that they were starting to get into trouble. They were spending it personally a great deal. So they were looking for the next best thing and they kept going back to sound. Couldn't make it happen. 1913, Edison um, invented the, the kinetophone, which you see the black unit right there. Worked for a little while. Um, it had a sound attachment that was, it was a phonograph again. It kept breaking, it just didn't work very well, unfortunately. But he sold a crap load of them, just, just, just a ton of them. And it and, and did pretty well, but finally it had to go away. It just didn't work. Um, all the investors that made film, that made, that made the, the, the sound to go with the film got pretty tired and didn't want anything to do with sound again until the 20s when things started happening. And what we're going to show you now, if you would, um, here's, yes, this film is leading up to that time. Now, the first film you're going to see, but already happened. It's three seconds long, <laughs> happened really quick, and it was the very first film movie ever made by a Frenchman. Uh, this is actually a, a, a called the blacksmith thing. This was staged with the three actors, um, able to hit, hit that anvil and, and use it pretty well. This is the sort of stuff in 1901, 1895 to 1901, was pretty much what people saw, and they loved every piece of it. <laughs> they just couldn't get enough of it. It was motion. Now, I told you about Tom Edison. He really was the guy that put a lot of emphasis in it. Um, a fellow that worked for him, W.K.L. Dixon, was a fellow that actually invented it, but it was under, under um, Edison's auspices. But he, this, that was Edison's studio. And we're going to see. The first bite of sound in 1895. Again, Dixon was the guy that re actually invented the kinetograph and the, the kinetoscope, um, the idea of, of, of a motion machine in, in this country. It won't be repeated three times. <laughs> okay. As you can see, they're, they're playing around a little bit calm. This is probably a small down to it. It's like a machine something like that. You saw all that noise that just happened. I guess we're going to play at least twice. <laughs> 
all that noise is driving people crazy. And, and just sitting on the table, just wouldn't tolerate it, even though they love the idea for a long time. This is a very interesting piece of film that a lot of people have seen. This is the, the execution of Leon Coljoyce in Auburn Prison. What you're looking at is Auburn Prison in 1901. Um, uh, Edison sent a crew up to film it, and the warden wouldn't let him in to pay it, actually film the execution. It's a bit morbid. Uh, but it was, it became to be the first shockumentary. Um, and uh, um, Ford, he sent Porter up, which was his big projectionist, uh, his big uh, cameraman at the time, and projectionist. And, and uh, you'll see a, a wide shot. This is an establishing shot uh, where they were. Because the warden wouldn't let them in, they had to change plans, and they paid one of the uh, jurors to, to remember everything that happened inside the prison. And, and they recreated it in their studio in New York when they went back down. And it was released a week later. I remember this film is 1901. It was crude, just getting going. We've actually cleaned it up, and it's still pretty good at shape. We got this from the Library of Congress. Now, this is the, re the recreation. Now, to, to prepare you for it, this is a scene of, a, of an electric chair. Um, albeit Edison's electric chair. This is the time to not even sound a uh, music accompaniment that's happening. There's a warden. Looks like my uncle, actually. <laughs> Coltrane's was actually uh, uh, was in uh, Oneida's Free Society for, for a year or two. And uh, actually, he was, he was an anarchist and he was difficult to get along with. They asked him to leave. He travels to Chicago and gets involved with more anarchists and gets this idea that McKinley's a bad guy and he needs to be shot. He needs to be killed. And that's what he did. He just walked up to him in Buffalo and shot him twice. Ironically, another Auburn piece, the architects that, that, that planned the building that he shot McKinley in were from Auburn. Don't remember their name, Kathleen, but they were, they were, they were in Auburn for. This shocked people. This was a big event. Um, seeing him rise up with, with the, you know, with the presumed electricity going through him, um, people passed out, they got sick, uh, and it just kept playing over and over again. They, the, 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 um, the, the people coming to the movie just were drawn to it. They're just coming back and they brought friends to see it and more friends to see it. It was, it was something they had just never seen before. An actual event being happening just a week or two after the original event, you know, you know, happening on film. Now, this is a great train robbery from 1903. It established a narrative form of, of, of filmmaking that hadn't happened before. We saw the closest narrative thing, the filmmaking we saw was was the execution, where where everything happened. But great train robbery was everything a western wanted to be. You had. You had People with guns, you had people dancing, you had Wild West people riding their horses all over the place, but it was silent. And some music here and there. But in pretty good shape when you think about this is close to 120 years old. Um, these are all snippets, by the way, none of them are full length. The full length is about 13 minutes. Um, we're we're going to run about three and a half minutes. The very train robbery obviously gives away the plot. It's a very train <laughs> robbery. <laughs> but something happens in a minute, and, and you'll see. What makes it most unusual and uh, brought in crowds and crowds of people. Yeah, this is Edwin Porter, 
Um, he was given free reign. He was actually brought on to, to make equipment, and uh, he had a knack for filmmaking, so Edison didn't want to do it. So he allowed um, for a free reign to do anything he wanted to do. And this one of the things came out of it. And Edison made so much money from this that he allowed him to make more and more and more films. My favorite silent Western hero, Bronco Billy uh, um, Anderson, was in this film. He was one of the bank robbers. But the coolest dude in the whole movie is, is Justice Barnes. You're going to see Justice in a minute. That's actually his name is Justice D. Barnes. <laughs> A lot of shooting. <laughs> I imagine there are tons of young boys. Uh, his father's brought him to see this over and over again. You know, 15 minutes long. They play like 15 times a day. There's Justice Steve Barnes. <laughs> That's the wow. difference when sound is put on a film. I recreated this place. It didn't have it didn't have this noise in it, but that's the kind of thing the sound does for a film. Um, this is interesting. This is called What Happened on 23rd Street in New York City. Again, this is sort of stuff that you want to see because it was so unusual. It was like a, when Atari just came out, that thing went back and forth, and we just loved it you know, because it was so new. Now, you're going to have to figure out what happened down 23rd Street. This runs again about, about two minutes long. It was very cool, to, you know, just, it's cool to see people back better. Mm -hmm. It's another post nineteen film. You know. It's the middle of summer. They just the closet women had to wear back then. My goodness. On what year is this? Uh, oh three. Oh. <laughs> now you figured out what happened on Twenty Third Street. That was such an occasion that they made a film about it and played it in theaters. <laughs> Now we let's get the French involved a little bit. This is Alice Guy Blanche, and uh, Alice was one of the first female directors, the most famous female silent director of her time. She this is she is making a film about making a film, and the most unusual thing here is that this is 1905. She's making a film about recording sound for a film. So if you look in the corner, you're going to see two horns. And um, you won't see it yet, but you'll see a turntable where she sets up a turntable. You can see all those old lights. It was probably 130 degrees in there easily, 130 degrees in that room. Um, the amount of lights they needed in those days. And this is that's Alice right there. You see she's, she's getting ready with a platter. Um, most of that, this was an unbelievable thing to think about in 1905. To, to link to link this machine. It, it's not that much different than this, only that, that's recording uh, instead of playing. And she's doing it. It was hard to picking up as much sound as her pen. Now it was a terrible sound. It was scratchy, it was noisy. Um, but there wasn't anything like it before. It. This is my favorite. Same time period, 1908. <laughs> 
Edison's making another foray into sound. This is great. This is a great sound. This is very cool. From 1913. Oh, tough fuck up, old boy. What are you looking for? Well, it's right, baby. It's both sides of the face of New York. These are stage actors that don't quite know how to handle themselves in front of the camera. Thank <laughs> you. 
in the 1920s. Um, it, at her peak, she was getting 45,000 fan letters a month that she hired a, a, a fan like so, of, of young people to, to write back. She answered every fan letter she ever got. Um, she, she was a good actress that did very well and broke into sound for a little while and found that she didn't like sound, sound, you know, sound pictures. Color is, is a three three different color process, a three stripe process. So you see, that has a blue haze on it. The first one, yeah, you know, has a different color. Um, yeah, yeah. This is the twenties before uh, uh, Will Hayes put the censorship board together. So you see a little more skin that you would normally see uh, starting in the late. This has a yellow haze, yeah, and another one of those stripes in it. It didn't work. It took a long time before Technicolor finally got their egg together you know, to make it economical. And these films were filmed with three different cameras, each filming it with a different filter on it. It would be blended together, one overlapping the other to make, to make the, the full color scene. There's a relationship between the audience and the, the director and, and, and the actor. Um, we draw our own conclusions. Um, you know, we're, we're, it's not a yelling force. We, we don't hear things, so we don't quite understand what's happening sometimes. And we put our own imagination into it. Uh, this is the chorus. I've worked with, with uh, this for a while. Um, 23, he rolled out his, his phone from the process. This is one of the films to show. Fifteen dollars on the front half of the bank account. That checks in bank accounts, no fun. No. Yes, three. Dark check on the first half of the bank. Fifteen dollars in bank accounts, no fun. Can you imagine the pain that the check made you take? You got sixteen dollars. Oh, this stuff is crazy. Come on, let's go down there. I wouldn't go to see any house. I live in this stuff. Yeah, that's right. Only did he get three houses there? Three houses, yes. Which one's yours? Then you see the scalp one. First house. That's your house. Now you see the scalp one. Oh, the bed. That's your house. I didn't see the middle. The middle. Yeah, all that's a lot of baby looking shit. Yeah, I've seen it just my Oh, that's your house? Yeah, but every night, now I'll take some. You know, mine. No. You know, last night, oh, I don't think I'll have to take it. Oh, come on. Can you wear it? I'll get it. You want to put your shades down in the middle of the night. Right. I passed your house last night, and I saw you up there in the window hugging and kissing your wife to beat the band. Uh-uh, boy. 
It feels bad, you. It feels bad, you. Last night I saw you hugging your kids in the light up there, and I say now it's a joke on you. Yeah, it's a joke on you. Why on me? Who lives now? It's not a problem. Oh, I could be. I was playing one of the girls. What's up? Right. Have you been to the audience in China, Japan? Oh, maybe who's that? 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 Every language we speak, sure, I want to speak Russian, oh, no, French, no, 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 you say you can answer your own question, and I can answer my own question. Let the contest how to set the challenge. Proceed. All right, now, did you, did you ever watch in the world? In the world? Yeah. Yes, sir, I've been in the world. You watch, sir. When you watch in the world, did you ever do a party? Oh, party? Well, what kind of party? Well, uh, I'll have the party. Yeah. 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 Yes, I've seen many of them. Yes, I have. See how? Do you know, now understand this, do you know how to help us meet that party without making any care of the house? Now, that's your question. It is. How does the rabbit make his hole without leaving any dirt on? Yes, sir. Well, I admit that's a very difficult question, and I cannot answer it. Can you? Could I? Can you? It is my question, and I want to answer it. Now, that's the bar. They start on the bottom, yes. or they dig off. Start from the bottom. Oh, oh yes, yes. Now I have you. How do they get to the bottom to dig off? It's not the joint. Oh, <laughs> that's it. Oh, my goodness. You can hear the sound is so tinny, it's not whole, it's, it's not, you know, it, it doesn't have quite all of the case touches that come a little later on. You know, what you're going to see next is some case experimental um, tests for these early tests. Brought out so that you can show you the next first test. Made in March of 1924. And once again, we'll bring the soundtrack out of hiding so that you can see it. The camera's not up to speed now. Uh, we're taking this about uh, 80 feet a minute. Uh, we do it from the length of speech. It is for us to let it rather be dedicated. <coughs> it is for us to let it rather be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they will fall here and thus far so nobly at last. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That to me, not a debt to take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here have to resolve that these debts shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a number of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not carry from the earth. Now, uh, here's the first word that I want to try. Uh, Jesus Christ. All right, yeah, yeah, you can shut the thing off now. Yeah, shut it off. Yeah, would you please shut the camera off? <laughs> off. The next test by the is in Jason Can you feel the air? Uh, I'd like to know 
whether you can feel the air coming to you. Uh, you people that are uh, sitting there watching this picture. Chris, uh, can you uh, can you feel it? Uh, can you eat I? I see. Uh, now the amplification on this number five microphone is G Whitaker's. Those lights were off your bright eye. Uh, it's five. It's a three night. The average man has never come in contact with the prison, and probably somewhere in the country. Although the average is alone, he ought to be interested. And it is considered that over half a million men, women, and children go in and out of our correctional institutions every year. It means an enormous amount of money. The uh, main trouble with the old prison system was that it dwelt entirely upon the idea of punishment. The punishment did not stop at the walls of the prison, but the prison was made not only a place of punishment, but a place of torture, of torture every day and every hour of the day. The old the books on phenology tell us that there are three reasons for the prison system. Retaliation, deterrence, and reform. But the idea of retaliation is wrong in itself. Vengeance is forbidden by any intelligent uh, idea of humanity. And it has, as a matter of fact, failed entirely in practice. Because when we attempt to retaliate from men for the injuries they've done, it usually results in their feeling that retaliation is again due for men to society. So that a man comes out of prison in a state of mind expressed by one who was about to leave Auburn prison when he said to me, you know how a man feels when he leaves the place of this kind of person? I tell you how I felt at the end of my first term. I hated everybody and everything. And I made up my mind I'd get even. In the course of getting even, he got back to prison the second time and the third time. So that retaliation is not only wrong in itself, but it is a failure as far as protecting society. On the other hand, when retaliation is given up, they have often tried a system of uh, what we may call an exaggerated idea of making prisoners reform by giving them privileges. They, uh, they try to drive them into accepting our point of view. But men cannot be successfully bribed any more than they can be successfully beaten into accepting our point of view. They must be trained for citizenship while they are in the prison. And in order to get the best results, we should send men to prison with an indefinite term, for we should not let men out of prison until they are reasonably satisfied that they will lead honest and useful lives. That depends, of course, upon the individual. And if not, we shall never solve the prison problem until we have a system uh, which gives every man a chance to develop his self-respect and to gain a firm idea of the right way to live in society. Fortunately, this is not theory. Such a system was developed 10 years ago in Auburn prison and has been successfully practiced not only in Auburn prison, but at Sing Sing and in the United States Naval Prison at Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And men were given a chance to have their own organization which cooperated with the warden in securing good conduct and the mutual welfare leads is the only prison system that has ever been developed, which is a real protection society. So in the next segment, we're going to talk a little bit about the Warner Brothers, Buckley and Fox. Um, this is this is a Fox Studios. I, I uh, was on a committee for a year there, and right where we were meeting was stages three and four and that gold medallion there is a movie town medallion that still hangs from from the 20s okay so we're 
relieve me for it. <laughs> yes. We'll stop a little bit just to talk about what you've seen so far, and uh, then we'll get into the second half where we're, we're going to get into how uh, uh, the late 20s, how sound came about, uh, both with, with, uh, with Warner and their synchronized system where you had a phonograph and a lot of pulleys, a lot of gears hooked up to a projector to try to get them to run at the same time and the same speed. That's how it was. That's what we call the phonograph system. And Mr. Cases, which was right on the film, and, and although that one scene was <laughs> synchronized very well, we're not giving you a pretty good example. But but uh, I'll, we'll talk about those two and and why one succeeded, um, one did. Um, it's always about people. It's, but sometimes it's about the product, and in this case, it was about the product. So, um, any questions you want? To, yeah, sure. Yes, uh, the, the film where uh, you have a violinist playing and two men dancing, yeah. there's, a, there's, there's a lot of ryth rhythmic clickety clock going on there. Is that the sound of their actual dance steps, or is it a simulation of their dance, or is that mechanical noise from the process? It's mechanical noise and the sound of their, their steps. It's 1895. Um, they're just, they, they like the idea. Edison actually wanted. 1995, Edison wanted a television. He wanted you to have um, a box that had sound and vision, that, but not to watch movies on, but to listen to music and educational programs. In fact, all the moguls really thought sound was perfect for, for music. Um, in some cases, with Warner Brothers, they were, they were um, um, myopically thinking um, about their own their, their own movies and they they uh, just wanted the system that they had that, that we'll talk about um, for uh, sound for music background for their own movies and and uh, it wasn't about this was so new that all it was one of these things one of these machines with a cone on it and you're talking into it there was it was crude at best. And you know, it had some there was some satisfaction there, but uh, it picked up everything until good microphones came to be. First, they they, they play a joke on that in uh, uh, singing in the rain. That's right. Making sounds, they're trying to get the microphones right. It's picking up everything that's happening. It's really having your arm and singing in the rain. It was the one girl with the Brooklyn accent that happened a lot. A lot of people were. Put on a we'll put on a work as a result of the talkies. Um, one in particular, John Gilbert, who was swashbuckling hero, um, made more money for MGM than maybe anybody at that time. Um, he had a, a normal voice that was a little high pitched, not a lot, and he did not get along with the fellow in MGM. So whenever he he talked, they cranked it up a little bit to make him sound more girlish. <laughs> and he was out of business in a year and a half. He was out of making films in a year and a half. So, so anything? Yeah, Steve. Well, was there any um, time that like the pit orchestras were going on down the street and up the street? They were, you know, because it must have been putting a lot of musicians on work at it. Was, it wasn't, wasn't. Um, the, uh, up until uh, the, the uh, Don Juan in 1926 or so, um, everything was still in theaters, as, as it related to theaters, they were still in the pit. You know, in the bigger theaters and the small theaters are organists. And uh, so there was a lot of work. Um, and if you could speak well, you could play well, you had work in Hollywood and you had a lot of it. Um, if things started changing, once, once dialogue, caught on. And there's a difference between sound and dialogue and uh, spoken dialogue are two different things. It meant two different things to, to the moguls, um, uh, you know, the fellows that ran the studios in, in the 20s. They, to sum that up, they were fearful of the actors. Um, if you saw some of the early movies, you always saw Edison's name, 
if it was a Fox film, you saw William Fox presents, if it was a universal film, that Carl Lumley presents, it was their baby. They, you know, they did everything they could. They, they fought with their family members, they fought with their friends, they fought with their business partners to, to keep their interests alive in the film industry. It was, it was cutthroat, it was litigious. Everybody sued everybody every day. There was a different lawsuit going on. So these guys wanted to hold on and they wanted credit for it. Well, actors came around and and they were well liked by, by the audience, and the audience started kicking them out. Um, Florence Lawrence was one of the first ones. Yeah. And, and the models knew that once once these actors with very large egos realized that they were why they were coming to the movie, not so much the story, um, they knew they were going to be in trouble. And sure enough, they were. And uh, um, that was, they didn't want them to talk. Um, uh, there's a point, uh, um, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to read some of the things that I was having trouble seeing in my notes, but um, there was one point that um, Sam, Sam, um, there's four brothers, four, four Warner brothers. There was Harry, the oldest, and Abe, and Sam, and Anna, and the, young, and the youngest, that we'll talk about a little later. Um, Sam was the electronics. Was that, oh, whenever you get a family together, there's always that one, one child that likes to fiddle around with things and take it apart and put them half back together and everything. That was Sam. He was the one that wanted sound to happen. He wanted new stuff to happen. And, and and Warner Brothers at that time, this is 1925, they were broke. Um, they put everything they had into it. Um, they got real lucky, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and got some big financing, but sound helped it. So, so Sam gets Harry to come to, uh, to, to hear um, um, General Electric's, uh, uh, excuse me, Western Electric's uh, sound system. And he was crazy. He was crazy excited. He thought how great this would be for music. And Sam said, well, just think, the actors could now talk. And Sam said, like hell they will. And <laughs> he was adamant that they, that they weren't going to get that kind of power. Now realizing that it actually made him more money by letting them speak and letting, letting films mature on that level. So to answer your question, there was, a, there was just a lot of work. The work didn't start going down for musicians until into the 30s. You got another one? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I was just wondering, do you think Billy Wilder was making a direct reference to that 23rd Street film? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Having the dress pulled up like he did with, with Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. That's interesting. Maybe very, very, very well. Be. It was, you know, something most unusual <laughs> <laughs> happening. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Provide a bit more context to the Osborne. Uh, yeah. Was that done here? Yeah, was, was done in this building. Uh -huh. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, Thomas Osborne uh, isn't as well known as he should be, especially in Hollywood. The Osborne family uh, made their money um, um, in manufacturing. They were the second and third largest farm manufacturing equipment in the country. And David, the dad, um, was very good at what he did. Thomas was the only son, and, um, and brought up in his mom uh, was was Quaker and, and brought up in a in a, in a fairly affluent uh, household, but with people that were that um, women especially that were strong and powerful and wanted to make changes in the world. Um, so he gets involved in that. He did what the things he touched were really remarkable. By then, you know, this would have been probably. 23, I don't know, 24, 25, I, mean, I don't think we know it. You think that's what it was? It was 20, 1925. There was an uh, Auburn had a um, like an exposition for like uh, all the like technology that was going on in uh, at that time period. And the case laboratory was very well represented, and they would show like clips of these uh, of these. And Osborne was one of the big ones. And by that time, his mutual offer leak had taken off, and it was very successful. He made a great deal of enemies especially Tamman Hall in New York, which controlled New York, he fought him and he fought him hard. And at one point, he was pretty much the, the most important politician in the state of New York. And, and uh, he did other things. William Randolph Hearst wanted to, uh, Tammany fellow wanted to, to run for governor of New York. And 
And it was, I was going along with it, being a, a God that stopped that from happening. More than that, he was he was the uh, most unusual man. I thought everybody should have a second chance. Strong, strong, strong. He, he uh, was on the board of the Jewish Union Republic, and on the way to Ithaca, and, and, and that idea of self-governing, and that everybody has a chance to self-govern. I don't want to get into a thing about Osmond too much, but, <laughs> um, that it would work, that it would work, and he brought that self-governance in, into, into the prisons. And for the most part, it worked. And, and the recidivism rate went down, and among other things. But um, he had a lot of problems. He had a lot of people who didn't like him. Spent a lot of his family's fortune on the <coughs> lawsuits. Anything else? Well, do you mind if I just read this first? Yeah. Good. Um, in this segment of our talk on movies and song, we'll zero in on the competitive atmosphere facing the players, namely a Wayne Fox, Sam Warner. Um, the synchronized sound, as I told you, police, ears, records, like they basically. Um, and Ted Casey's sound on film process. According to film critic uh, Edward Kellogg and others, Warner Brothers in particular, Desperately wanting to break into the higher echelons of power. There were, in Hollywood, there was a big five. Warner wasn't one of them. And they wanted, they wanted to be in the big five. The big five got all the great theaters and, and the like. Uh, they made large investments in sound stages and equipment. In July of 26, uh, Fox decided they wanted to do the same thing as it related to sound. And uh, um, Believing the Ted Case sound on film system was the better vehicle for success, when the Fox formed the Fox Case Corporation, uh, licensing the Case Laboratory patents, using Case's developments to reinvent his movie tone news service, uh, which was set up in 1919, and kind of lingering. Uh, there were a lot of news services back then in theaters. Uh, William Randolph Hearst had a big one, Pat Day had one. Um, there, were, there were a few, um, and, uh, and, and so did Fox. Now, in 1919, things changed. The three German fellows um, invented a way. I'm going to read this to you because I can't say it any other way. And just reading it, you're going to realize just how difficult it is because you can't read it back. I don't think you could say it back to me. Um, they invented um, um, the tri ergon process, a process capable of transforming audio waves into electricity. That's easy enough. It was initially used to imprint those waves into film strips that, when played back, a light would shine through the audio strip, converting the light back into electricity and then into sound. Oh, wow. I, how would you even write it down to, to, to decide you wanted to do that? But because they did it and they did it well, it, it moved it moved sound sound on film into into a place that winds up in doing very well when, when Case uh, um, works out some of his problems with, with, with filaments in, in the light and basic photo cells. But the brothers Warner and Wayne Fox considered change essential, mostly because Warner was close to bankruptcy, as I said, and Fox was not satisfied with being in third place. Uh, MGM and Warner Brothers, or excuse me, MGM and Paramount always beat him. He was the toughest guy in Hollywood. He just took on anybody that got in his place. And he wasn't scared of anything and he wasn't scared to borrow money, which eventually became his downfall. And uh, he was an unbelievable entrepreneur, truly unbelievable entrepreneur. Uh, was, it was, was born in Europe into poverty and came here and, and uh, um, he did all kinds of things, sold everything he could possibly think of uh, to make money, opened up his first, his, his first, uh, uh, theater in Nickelodeon, um, Nickelodeon, you know, uh, five cents and, and something to see. Um, and they broke for a while. And he took on Edison. He was the guy that finally broke Edison's back. Um, Edison was trying to keep the industry real tight um, with about 10 of them. Um, he formed the syndicate, a couple of motion patents company, and, and uh, wouldn't allow anybody else to have it unless they paid big money. Um, Edison owned the patent on the sprockets on the film. 
So you couldn't show film unless you paid Edison something. And if you brought film from other, from like a um, um, cafe from, from Europe, uh, you still had to use some, some Edison equipment. He hired uh, goons. Um, there was talk that, that Hollywood started because filmmakers were trying to run away from Edison Braden. They were looking for the sun. They needed, you saw those cameras in the 1905 um, um, LSD um, uh, uh, film. They needed a lot of light. So they went to California. It worked out real well there. Look like at 126 days of Navy sunshine in New York. They're getting it every day out there. And, and, but as they did follow them there, they went to Florida, they went to Cuba, they went to Texas. They were in Chicago, they wind up in Hollywood, and wherever they went, Edison followed them. Um, if they wouldn't pay what they're supposed to pay, he, the goons would take bats and beat up their projection equipment and their cameras equipment. This really happened. You know, he didn't like movies, but he he liked what he owned and, and expected you to pay what, what he thought he was due. Um, so Fox, London from Universal, they sue him, and it goes on for a while, it goes on for a while. The, the industry got so big that the courts finally had to say, this is too big for one, one fella and two friends to control. And, uh, and they favored Fox. And it was Fox that changed it. They were called the independents or the outlaws. And, and ironically, um, Fox and uh, the Universal and, and others, um, they wind up becoming the dudes that, that, that run Hollywood and all the people that were associated with Edison uh, wound up falling by the wayside and either selling out or just closing up completely. They're, they're not, a, again, sorry, I'm getting carried away here. Their motto was they like the two really, they like the 10 minute film. They like, they have four or five of them on, on, on you know, uh, at a time shown. And you take a break and you hear some music, like Steve with that orchestra and you know, you take a break and you hear some comedians, there was vaudeville and film showing together. Well, the independents, uh, um, Marvin from, from Biograph, from, from, you know, from Canastota, they who moved to New York um, and became very prolific. They wanted these longer films. They wanted people to sit and enjoy a story. And, and the Edison folks were really making a lot of money. They were really happy to keep the status quo. And that is a theme throughout Hollywood and into going into sound. But you can't see it today. How many Avenger movies are we gonna wind up watching? <laughs> you know, um, I'm the first one in line, honestly, I'll watch those movies they can make, but that's what Hollywood does um, uh, over and over again. And because of the success of the of uh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so. So in 1913, Edison does the 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 with that with the sound attachment. Um, works for a little while. You saw the film of that. Um, wasn't good enough. It dies, and mostly because of the wacky belt system that they have now. Um, so Edison goes back for some more money, and they say, "How many times are you going to come to us?" But so I know I can make it better. And uh, they gave up and would not give them any more money for sound for quite a while. So we get into um, big money then. So now it's middle, middle teens of, of um, the 1910, or excuse me, the 1910s. And AT&T decides to get into the movie business. And, uh, and not only AT&T, they form Radio Corporation of America, which was RCA, remember the, who became a competitor? Edison, you remember the picture of the dog, the Dalmatian with you know, his master's voice kind of thing? That was RCA. They all had money, um, mostly from AT&T. And AT&T had as much money as Rockefeller had in the steel business. They had a lot of money. They decided they wanted to be in the film business. So um, around that time, you got the forest around 1919, getting the idea that he wants, he wants to do the same thing. His audio on tube, if I said that right, is very successful. It launches him into radio, um, and, and, and radio, of course, becomes the, the medium way of, of listening to things. And uh, um, the force is going on his route. AT&T comes in with their 
boatload of money that they had, and they start General, um, excuse me, Western Electric um, to do the same thing. And then we have the forest uh, and Mr. Case coming together. Now the forest was what we would call um, a raconteur. He he uh, was brilliant. He was a brilliant individualist. He didn't, he didn't do so well in, with, with partnerships. Um, you know, the old story of partnerships are marriages without sex. And, and you're in a business partnership, you're, you're together all the time. And if you have no reason to make up, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And that's what was happening with, with the forest in case. case. Case wasn't getting the kind of credit he was, he was getting. He, he gave the forest a lot of the stuff. And, uh, and the force wasn't necessarily telling everybody that, that it was, you know, cases, cases stuff that brought him over the hurdle to, uh, to make some pretty good stuff like you saw in 23, still not perfect, but pretty darn, pretty darn close. Um, also the force uh, was a storyteller. He liked to tell a lot of stories. Sometimes he exaggerated a great deal and, uh, People caught on to that. He wasn't a good business manager, so he, he always needed money. And, and after all, had trouble getting it. Now, Case um, was independently wealthy himself from it. Again, another father son story in, in, in the life. Um, uh, did okay, but he finally had, had enough. And so, uh, well, the forest develops his photo film process. And he had an abundant amount of energy. One thing he had to truly give him credit for is he brought Case to a, to a place he really wasn't giving credit that Case had never been before. And that was that, that he was touching a lot of people. In a, in, in, and while the films weren't shown in great quantity, um, they were, he was getting them into some theaters. Um, unfortunately, for the most part, um, and that's for another time when we can just talk about case, because um, I'd love to do that and to bring up somebody that's a real case, case expert to, to, to help us with that. Um, they fell apart. Um, but Western Electric uh, was an important piece. Now, Western Electric was also um, with that audience too, the other two. They were, they were, they needed amplification. If you're gonna do great projection in big houses, um, and, if I can back up just a little bit, the film really started with the kinetoscope. Now, what you're going to see over there is a projecting kinetoscope, um, the one with the wood in front that came, that came out of Edison's, Edison's lab. Before that, there was it was a peep show type device. It ran for about a minute, and you looked in, and you you know, and you cranked, and you saw this, this short film. Um, Mute the mutoscope done by by great people from Canastota. It it was a paper thing, paper process with persistence of vision. Where it was like a flip flip book that you saw where you see motion. And the same thing happened. Now that was one person, one nickel, one time. Um, the French got the idea. We got to project. Man, we got to start making some real money here. This stuff costs a lot to make. And uh, and Edison got that book too. And started projecting and the construction made a big difference. So let's go on to uh, Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers pictures needed something exciting and sound might have been that. Um, the problem was uh, Warner's was they were at the bottom of, of they were in poverty row when they started. There, there is a if you if you know anything about film history there was this poverty row and People like John Wayne came out of poverty with all those Westerns, you know, those monogram Westerns and RKO Westerns that were, were all in that poverty role. They made B and C films that uh, they took the kids to on Saturday afternoons to, to watch. Um, Warner, Warner wanted to be amongst the top people, and, uh, and they figured Sony was going to help them do that. Um, um, they started um, actually, uh, I was joking, generally, they started in Ohio, um, to Duquesne. Film company and did very well. Made more money, made more money, and they got, they, they they were probably the best um, guardians of, of money of any of, of any of the moguls. They knew how to save it. But luckily, uh, Harry Warner met a fellow by the name of Wado Catchings. He was a, a financier um, with Goldman Sachs. He loved movies, and 
And so Harry told him what they wanted to do. He'd gone to see the visit. Sam took him to the, to the, to the premiere. He gets excited about, about music, you know, sound in films, music, um, and uh, sound effects maybe. And, uh, and he tells uh, Catchings what he wants. He puts Catchings on the board. Catchings gets them a lot of money. 10 million to start, another 3 million in bonds thereafter. And Warner's is off and running. They bought, now Warner's didn't have a distribution system yet. They didn't have much of anything. They had a deal with Western Electric, who I probably started telling you this sort of didn't finish. Western Electric affected the, the amplification of the sound. And, and once they had the amplification worked out, um, then they could start do that, doing that projection that, that, that uh, Edison dreamed about. Um, so they buy by the Vitagraph Corporation, which had distribution. They had a whole mess of theaters. Warner's wanted to be in the theater, and they were off and running. Um, by 1925, they became a force. Um, um, once they, they got all that money, they, they ventured into radio, which, which um, once they got into radio, they had a station called KFWB. They started meeting sound people. And mostly Sam, because Sam was, remember, Sam was the guy that liked to tinker with, tinker with stuff. So Sam meets a guy by the name of Nathan Levinson. But Levinson um, was, um, was Western uh, Electrics Los Angeles fellow. So, um, they became good friends, and, and Levinson is trying to get Sam excited again, uh, so excited about sound that they would pour some of that $13 million they got it, you know, into it. Now, what he didn't know is Warner wanted to do it all along. That's why Christians came on board and things were happening. Um, at the time, Sam was only 37 years old. He was the little boy in that mix. And uh, um, brilliant, with a brilliant mind. Um, um, the story is that Sam, uh, once Sam saw that, that presentation that I told you about, he was like a spring lamb seeing an open field, is the way they described it. He couldn't wait to get to Harry. He couldn't wait to change Warner Brothers. He couldn't wait to make money and be successful and, uh, and, and have his parents' problem. His parents, their, their parents were an important part of that family. Um, so he lies to Harry. You know, just be telling the rest of the story. He lies to Harry. He lies to Abe, the treasurer, and they go see it and get excited. And now they want it. They're in. Um, that's really all we need to know. Uh, now we're going to get into the film. It's 1926. Uh, Warner Brothers is quietly working on a film called Don Juan. I don't know if you're familiar with Don Juan. It was the great with Dario. Um, and, uh, and based on I forget, I forget who I did. They, they put it together and they decided to have this synchronized sound, like the Vitagraph system, um, with for music and for sound effects. On August 26th at the Warner Theater in New York, they played it. The anticipation was so great, tickets were going for $10 a piece. Now, uh, the difference between 1926 and today is almost 20 times. So they were paying $200, it's us paying $200 for the ticket for, for something that we didn't know, we like or not. Um, the, the place sold out, but it didn't really have that spark that, that, that the Warners thought they did, mostly because of what Steve was saying about orchestration. Um, the, the higher end um, moviegoer that was at that $200 event said, was it really any different than having an orchestra in the pit? Stalled sound for a while, less than 26. And then, uh, um, we're going to show snippets of that line and get a feel for Barrymore really early early in his life and being that long. Um, luckily, uh, um, Sam persevered. He takes down one on the road, um, that one starts making money, and by the end of 27, um, Warner Brothers has got a couple, three million in the bank, and they're happy, and things are going well. Um, um, William K. Averson, I don't know if anybody remembered him, he, he was a, a, a leading film professor in the uh, 60s, 70s, he said, um, although Don Juan in 26 and far more significantly the jazz singer in 27, which we will talk about, clearly signaled the ultimate end of the silent era. 
The years 27 and 28 represented a curious phenomenon. Uh, while silent film as an industry was dying, it was still growing as an art form. Product was getting better, still getting better. Stories were getting better. A lot of things were happening. There was, as a result of the growing popularity of the vital phone presentations, Don Juan and the different, the very shorts they put with it. With it, the company uh, installed hundreds of systems and theaters around the country. Synchronized systems. So they, they, had, a, they had a head start over, over Fox, who we're going to talk about in a minute. Moving forward, the Warner Brothers did a couple of good things. They were good negotiators. They negotiated with, with General Electric that only they could use their amplifiers. Well, General Electric couldn't sell an amplifier before that. Nobody wanted sound. You remember, not even the moguls wanted to take a chance again on all the problems. And, and the million dollars it cost for the 1913 fiasco with, with Edison. So they're hungry. Even though AT&T owns them, and they have a lot of money, they're hungry. They got to make a sale, or somebody's going to get canned. And, uh, and they make the deal with Warner Brothers. Um, the problem is, um, Don Juan comes out, and people are starting to get itchy and thought sound. They're thinking, well, maybe it does work. But not those actors. Those actors can't talk, but it might work. Um, so general, um, um, I was going to say general electric, they were competitive, believe it or not, they were another sound system yeah, that we won't be talking about today. Um, Western Electric has to get out of the deal. They find a way to sue Warner and everything. And the first guy they go to is William Fox, who needs amplification because remember, he likes sound too, um, but not for even music. William Fox wanted sound for news. Or movie tone news. Um, his movie tone news that, that he built in 1919, that was, he had to read the news on the screen with pictures, he just didn't have it, just didn't cut it. And, uh, and he thought, what a great idea. And he heard about this guy, Case, in you know, and, and whoever he sends people, sends people there, I probably should move forward for that. Um, well, let me, let me finish the warning. Probably the Warner thing first because it's, it's worth going to start. So Warner knows they got something. They made some money with, with Don Juan once it went on the road. And um, people were still paying about three dollars a ticket for it in houses in, in smaller towns like Cincinnati and the like around the country. Three bucks was still sixty dollars a ticket, you know, that we wouldn't it had to be something special to pay sixty dollars a ticket to go to the movie today. Um, uh, so they decided to make a musical, a dramatic musical. And they catch upon the idea for a film called, uh, a story, uh, a play called The Jazz Singer. And they have the problems of trying to get the right people to do it. They finally get Elle Jolson signed up for it and they make it. And there's some um, interesting things that happen that we'll talk about when we make the movie when, when it goes. But The Jazz Singer plays and the world has changed overnight. Fortunately, the day before the jazz singer played, um, at, I believe at the, uh, at the Warner in New York, or at the Warner in New York, um, Sam, uh, Sam Warner dies. Okay. 40 year old guy drops dead. Um, they're so upset about it. The family is so upset about it. They don't even go to the jazz singer premiere, so they have no idea that people are standing up and clapping and crazy about the little dialogue that was in it. Um, Al Joseph actually doesn't say a word until 17 minutes in the movie. He doesn't say that much after that. But it was so exciting that people in that audience that night stood up and cheered. And uh, um, once the Warner, the Warner Brothers, the three remaining Warner Brothers, you know, um, their, their brother, they went into a full tour. So, so Let's talk about Case, and let's talk about Fox at that point. Fox told me showing up interest in sound movies, as I told you. Um, Fox had investigated the sound of film uh, system developed by Case and Ed Elsonable, and promised a potentially vast improvement over the cumbersome Western electric disc. Um, some of the things that kind of interesting. Um, Theater Case and Earl Sponnable, two semi Record scientists. I don't know if that's really true. A true statement was possible, but it certainly was true with the case. Um, uh, worked in a private lab. 
It just happened to be on these grounds right here. Um, and in 1913, uh, um, Ted Case established a private laboratory with his dad uh, here in Auburn, uh, spurred by the recent uh, breakthroughs in television, telephone, and radio. Case and his assistants found the software better, the audion tube built by the forest. 1917, the case uh, had perfected the thalified cell, a highly improved vacuum tube, um, and began to integrate the invention into a system for recording sound. It's part of the work case meets the forest. I remember the forest, big personality, big promises, smart guy. For business and personal reasons, um, uh, he turned all his laboratory efforts to vesting the forest once that deal fell through. And again, it's it, it's a story for another for another night that we were just talking about what was happening at that time. Within 18 months, the case labs produced an improved sound on film system, again based on the film by itself. A case uh, quietly constructed with his own funds, a complete sound studio and projection room adjacent to his laboratory which is where we're sitting right now. And, uh, this is where this film guys all chose <laughs> in the room. <laughs> these folks did this thing. In 1925, Case determined he was ready to try to market, to market his invention. Um, long story short, there were a lot of things happening in the middle of that. Um, so bottom line, EI Spotable invent, invited Edward Kraft of Western Electric Auburn to take a look at what they had. Now, um, the fellas, uh, Kraft, loved it, thought it was good stuff, very excited. Case now thinking, well, maybe we have a deal with, with Western Electric, and we don't have to be that, that, that mm -hmm. those, those people knocking on doors to try to, to, try to get our system. So, Western uh, Kraft sends two, two people from Bell Labs to take a look at it. Bell Lab people are crazy about it. It's a good thing to do. But um, Western Electric, uh, notifies case that yeah your 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 system's good but I don't know it's not it's no better than ours. Um, needless to say they were mistaken, but uh, for whatever reason they uh, uh, general uh, Western Electric passed them. I'm working with the case. Uh, we bought a uh, case decided to solicit a show business doctor for himself. He meets um, John J. Murdoch, the longtime general manager of the Keith LV Vaudeville circuit, a real powerful force. In entertainment. Uh, Case uh, argued that his sound system could be used to record musical and comedy acts. Um, the same idea Harry Warner had um, maybe six months earlier. Um, Edison, uh, Edison's uh, um, problem is Murdoch got burnt by Edison in 1915. He didn't want to come up with any more money than he had to, even though he liked what Case was doing. He wasn't too crazy about reaching in his pocket. So it doesn't work out so well. Uh, Case moved to the second tier of the US film industry producers distributing company, uh, film booking office, Warner Brothers, Fox, Universal. Um, in 26 case signed with Fox. It was a, must have been unbelievable. Uh, an unbelievable day when that happened. And the spirit of the idea that all things touch Responsible contact with John Joy, an old Cornell friend who represented Courtney Smith, the president of the Fox Newsreels. Um, they were, uh, as I said, Cornell friends. Um, just can't get away from it for nothing again. And the reason that sound newsreels could push that branch of Fox film to the forefront of the industry, that made Fox very happy. Uh, so in June 26, Smith asked Case to arrange a New York demonstration for for a uh, company owner and founder um, and president of Wayne Fox. This Case and Spinable demonstrated their sound system to Fox representative at Fox's Temple Island Parlor and at the Nemo Theater somewhere in New York. Um, then what was the decisive factor of private screening of William Fox's home at Woodmere, New York? Uh, something. Fox was pleased, and within a month, um, on July 23rd, 26, Fox Case Corporation was formed to produce sound motion pictures. Um, I would, he's turned all patents over to the corporation, 
Um, the new company was zoned 25% by Fox Films. Uh, 75% was divided between Fox Theaters, William Fox, Theater Case, and his associates. Um, so the deal was made. Uh, but not before moving the case slash recording equipment to the Fox studio there, um, they made 300,000 feet of test footage when they were in New York, most led by, led by Stone. Get the system down, get it down right, the equipment settled. Um, no, you know, we think of an, app, uh, an amplifier like, you know, uh, you know, one of my, my friends in the music business would just grab and kick, carry out the door. These amplifiers are as big as a wall. And it wasn't, it wasn't easy to, to work with. It looked like, you know, Frankenstein's laboratory, quite frankly. But not before, uh, yes. Um, for Case, uh, it climbed and out successfully. Fox Case assumed all liability regarding any lawsuits. Remember, there were a lot of lawsuits going on. And they were really worried about the forest who loved to sue people as well. Um, Fox also, um, uh, Case also received 2,500 shares of Fox Preferred Stock and 25,000 shares of Fox Common Stock. Uh, Spawnable winds up joining Fox out there, and Case uh, was hired as a consultant to write in the money that was needed at his discretion. Case Research Lab was contracted to manufacture the light cells they needed for the next three years. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, and Kirsten and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, we, we tend to, to, uh, to kind of put blinders on when we talk about history. We're talking about case and smile, and maybe a couple other people. That's all we think about. But um, Pearson brought up, well, who was blowing the glass for the, for the cells? And who was, who was, there are a lot of people here working in with a lot of great stories we love to tell you about it as well. And simultaneously, Fox began building a chain of motion picture theaters. At that time, Fox Film controlled only 20 small neighborhood houses in the New York City area. By 27, the Fox chain included houses in Philadelphia, Washington, Brooklyn, uh, as well as New York, St. Louis, Detroit, um, Newark, Milwaukee, goes on and on and on. He, he was growing like crazy, and all of the impetus that he got from this idea to sound and say that the richer than New York he was. Um, Meanwhile, uh, Cortland, Smith, uh, Cortland Smith had assumed control of Fox Space in, and in 1926, he's the guy that ran the movie television. Uh, and in 1926, initiated the innovation of the case on film technology to movie film. Uh, at first, all he could over, um, oversee were, were defensive actions designed to protect Fox cases for the position. There were still issues about patent rights and, and lawsuits and the like. In September 26, exactly two months after incorporation, Fox uh, case successfully supported the claim by the forest and Triurgon. And, uh, and uh, in the Triurgon's case, they just gave a few grand. Will that do it? Will, that, will you leave us alone now? If we give you $1,000, it's okay. Right. The last Fox case could have solved the marketplace, and that's what they did to the solve the marketplace. Um, they wanted them a quicker. Much more quicker than, than William wanted to. William was a safe, shrewd man. And so, movie talk happens. We're going to show you some movie talk footage. It's pretty cool. Uh, and, then, um, and then, as things happen, they make uh, their first movie with, with, with some sound, with, with music and some sound effects. That was a film called Sunrise. We're going to show you pieces of that. They brought in a fellow by the name of F.W. Renau. Renau was a was the most unusual director. He had made Nosferatu in 1922 in Germany. Uh, he was stylistic. He was, he was the most unusual. And Sunrise, in my opinion, may be the greatest film ever made that no one knows about. I don't know. And you'll see some great stuff about that. Um, what made Movie Tone happen very quickly as well is they were fortunate enough to catch Lindbergh before he took off in that plane to go across. And the Lindbergh piece was a, was a pretty big deal. I don't know if getting into too much detail. Um, why don't we roll the film? We can, we'll talk a little more about the film. Let's roll the Oh. 
People think of a collection for somebody just to stand by the, <laughs> the switch. I'm over Cronkite. What you see behind me is my voice, a picture of it. This is a motion picture soundtrack, and this is the end result of a show business revolution that still ranks as one of the big entertainment stories of the 20th century. Whereas once a scene would have to play like this. <laughs> the same scene could now play like this. Take you for a ride. Today the story of how all of this happened. The movies learn to talk. Many civil war. The victorious rebels march into a deserted room. They now can drive on to the great resort city of San Sebastian, their next goal. The refugees watch the tragedy of their town, exiled from their home and their homes are in flames. Down in Wales, nightclub troubadour Harry Richmond and pilot Dick Merrill greeted by Movie Tones Broadway commentator Ed Sullivan. Congratulations, Harry. Thank you, Ed. Congratulations, Dick. Thank you very much. After crossing the deep blue sea bound for dear old London, they landed in a Welsh potato patch. So the nightclub troubadour must croon a request to the Welshman, farmer Jimmy Jones. How do you do, Mr. Jones? How do you do? My name is Mr. Richmond, and this is Mr. Merrill. How do you do, Mr. Merrill? We just dropped in from America. And sorry to have to make an airport out of your pretty little farm. Well, I, I, but I, was, I was wondering if you'd be nice enough to take this fence down so we can take off. We'd like to get to London. Oh, I will do anything for it. So down with the fence and on the Piccadilly. After the first half of the transatlantic round trip, they'll fly back. Recrossing the deep blue sea bound for little old New York, they'll land in the Newfoundland swamp. Didn't understand one. By the way, the very first uh, uh, sound of film system, camera system that we don't had weighed 1,500 pounds. They had to move around before they got portable.
the, the last scene was the one that got away. And you could never get over it. He was so in love with her. But she wouldn't have anything to do with him. This is Sunrise. Um, not a lot of music, enough um, that made an impression. At that time, uh, Germany was in the height of their, their uh, um, expressionism uh, phase, which was a, a style that, you, that distorted art, art design and, and symbolic <coughs> gestures. This is a story of um, the country boy goes to the city and meets one of those city girls. That one in particular, Mary Livingston. He's happily married with a child. Um, his wife is Janet King, and uh, his wife was good until he meets the city, the lady from the city. Or more, more uh, they call him the girl from the city. This was a, a, a promo for, for the movie. You'll see what they're doing in a minute. That's George O'Brien.
Those city girls, I'm telling you. happened and this is the beginning of uh, you know, get an idea of what might have happened in the this is again we're now doing that expressionism and, and, uh, and it was a hard situation because the cameras weren't that developed focus it came out of focus very easily and of course none of that is real Won two Academy Awards. The very first Academy Awards were in 29. I won two of them. The best picture in for Janet Gaynor. Bronx. A lot of nice green grass up there, a whole lot of people you know. Ginsburg, Dutchburg, 
Now the gold bird, oh, oh, a whole lot of birds. I don't know all. I'm going to buy you a nice black silk dress, Mama. Uh, you see, Mr. Friedman will put his wife to be jealous of you. Oh, yes, she will. You see it here. And I'm going to get you a nice pink dress that'll go with your brown eyes. No, I, I what, what do you mean, no? Who is, who is telling you? What do you mean, no? Yes, you'll wear pink or else. Or else you'll wear pink. And now, let's, oh, I'm going to take you to Coney Island. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Want to ride on a shoot and shoot? <laughs> As you know, in the dark mill. Yeah. Ever been to dark mill? Well, with me, it's all right. I'll teach you. How do you feel, my right? <laughs> Now, Mama, Mama, stop now. Just get this. Mama, listen, I'm going to sing this like I will if I go on the stage, you know, with this show. I'm going to sing it jazzy. Now, get this. Blue sign, smiling at me, 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 nothing but little blue sign, do I see? Stop, 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 stop. There you have it. The film industry was forever changed. The way we watch movies was forever changed. And between Don Juan, Don Juan Sunrise, and, and uh, she had a singer. It happened. And, and they never looked back. They immediately, Hollywood immediately um, embraced sound. Uh, the movies they had made in 28 and, and that were being made for 29, um, a great many of them. We reach out with sound, and the uh, world was probably better for it as it relates to entertainment. Um, I was just saying, uh, there's an interesting note. Um, there are, there's a lot of questions about whether uh, whether Jolson um, said those words, wait a minute, wait a minute, um, because uh, there's talk that it was improvised at the last minute. That was a, a, an expression he used a lot when he was on when he was on stage. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He hadn't heard nothing yet. And he would go into his thing. I'm Homer Cronkite. Nice what you see behind me is my voice, a picture of it. This is a motion picture soundtrack. Don't you miss Walter Cronkite? <laughs> In any event, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Was voted the 71st best quote ever to come out of Hollywood. And, uh, Right, there's a, there's a, you know, something for everybody. Um, it was nominated for best writing and it won an honorary Academy Award a few years later. Um, but I'd just like to close tonight, and we're running a little over maybe. Um, but to close tonight by saying it's hard to to say to you how much this industry owes to to Ted Case. No one had done it. No one was able to do, do it. If anyone was able to do it to Forrest Wood, then he couldn't. The case came in and he did it and he changed entertainment um, and made it better. I think we all have a round of applause before we leave today. What do you say? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? We give you a round of applause? No. <laughs>